Chicago's International O'Hare Airport, May the 25th, 1979, and America's worst air disaster. All 273 people aboard an American DC-10 airliner died when the plane crashed shortly after takeoff. It lost its port engine, and after climbing out of control for a few crazy seconds, it plunged back to the ground, exploding in flames. There was no chance of anyone surviving. The consequences were drastic for all DC-10 operators in the United States and throughout the world. The West German airline Lufthansa was especially badly hit. It flies 11 DC-10s, more than any other non-American airline. As a consequence of the Chicago disaster, the American Federal Aviation Authorities, and also the manufacturers, McDonnell Douglas, ordered the grounding of all DC-10s in the country. The plane's airworthiness certificate was withdrawn, and almost all other countries followed suit. Some 274 DC-10s operating around the world were affected, and worried officials began to assess the implications. One thing was immediately clear. With the DC-10s back in the hangars, many passengers would be unable to fly. The other available aircraft just could not cope. A complication in the whole issue is the fact that many airlines have later models of the aircraft, not the basic Series 10 which crashed at Chicago. Japan Airlines, for example, have nine DC-1040s, and most other non-American airlines use the DC-1030. Both are later and longer-bodied versions, and the airlines hope, in these cases, that they aren't affected by any basic flaw in design, if there is one. The experts are concentrating their attention on the pylon, which suspends the engines from the wings. Evidence of metal fatigue and even dangerous cracks were soon found on other DC-10s. It's a huge problem for all concerned, and some airlines are trying to take action of their own. In Europe, where 78 planes are grounded, 21 countries agreed to meet in Zurich in June to draw up their own program of inspection and maintenance. The biggest headache belongs to McDonnell Douglas, who have so much of their future invested in the DC-10. In the late 1960s, a new generation of wide-bodied airliners was conceived by the aircraft engineers using big fan jet engines. Boeing had already cornered the long-haul section of the market with its 747, the jumbo jet. Lockheed was aiming for the medium-haul market with its TriStar, and then McDonnell Douglas decided to join the race. It was a cutthroat competition, with both companies needing to sell hundreds of planes to show a profit. However, McDonnell Douglas went ahead and put into practice their aggressive motto, fly before they roll. In other words, get their plane into the air before their rivals had even left its hangar. They succeeded, and the DC-10 made its maiden flight in August 1970, nine months ahead of the TriStar. In July 1971, the first two models were delivered to two American commercial airlines and the aircraft made its first scheduled passenger flight the following month between Los Angeles and Chicago. The three-engine jetliner seemed ideal to meet modern aviation problems, the power to take off on normal length runways and the capacity to carry a maximum of 380 passengers in the economy class arrangement. The aim was to relieve airport congestion merely by increasing the numbers carried by a single aircraft, even on medium haul routes. The DC-10 proceeded to establish itself as a successful model both in the domestic and international markets. The millions of dollars invested in it appeared safe. There were early signs, however, that the safety of the plane itself might be less than perfect. In June 1972, this American Airlines DC-10 lost a rear cargo door over Ontario in Canada. 
The passenger cabin floor collapsed after the sudden loss in pressure, severing most of the hydraulic control cables. Only the fact that the aircraft was lightly loaded, combined with the skill of the pilot, enabled the plane to land safely with the 67 people aboard. March 1974, and the scene near Paris of one of the worst plane accidents ever recorded. 346 people died, including an entire British rugby team, when a crowded DC-10 crashed in a wood. It had taken off a few minutes earlier on the comparatively short trip to London. The Turkish Airlines plane was also found to have lost its rear cargo door, just like the one in Ontario nearly two years previously. Again, the cabin floor collapsed, severing control cables, but this time the consequences were horrific. There were no survivors, and the giant plane was reduced to charred and twisted metal. The cargo door was found to have a basic fault in design. But worse than that, modifications recommended after the Ontario crash by American safety authorities had not been carried out on the doomed aircraft. The charge was made that this was a tragedy that could have been avoided. November 1975 at New York's Kennedy Airport. A DC-10's engine blew up during preparations for takeoff, apparently after hitting a flock of birds. The pilot managed to pull up before the end of the runway, but again, vital controls were lost. Hydraulic failure robbed the plane of 50% of its brake power, and the undercarriage collapsed. Fortunately, all the passengers were airline employees, well-versed in escape drill, and no lives were lost. After the Chicago disaster, though, it's the engine mountings that have come under the closest scrutiny. The huge turbo fans are slung below and ahead of the wings by means of a pylon. And it's this section that has been most talked about at the hearings by a congressional subcommittee into the whole DC-10 affair. As a government body, it's the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, that's having to answer questions why it didn't act earlier over safety aspects of the plane. A drawing of the DC-10 engine wing and pylon assembly. This is the engine out here, very large and heavy mass. This is the wing at this point. And this structure that goes from here to here is the pylon. It is the arm. Witnesses also produced wing, photographic evidence of stress cracks in the engine mountings. Upward, under the pylon, this is viewing this flange that is bent downward, clearly visible, is a significant crack along here, along this radius, where the strength member comes here, the flange comes out. DC-10s throughout the world, then, have been put under the closest scrutiny. The biggest worries are for the smaller private airlines dependent on the aircraft. For example, the SkyTrain service, run at cut price rates between London and the United States by British businessman Sir Freddie Laker. Laker Airways use six DC-10s, and they are all the earlier Model 10. The service has proved immensely popular with the public because it has slashed fare prices on the lucrative Atlantic run. But travellers and operators were less than happy when the British Civil Aviation Authority ordered the grounding of all British registered DC-10s following the line taken in the United States. What is that? It's £186.50, yeah. OK? And then we just tear up your uh, credit cards next. There were scenes of confusion at London's Gatwick Airport on the day of the ban. No one disagreed that safety came first, but the public had put its trust in the experts. If there was a serious design fault, most people felt it should have been made known long before. Passengers on this flight only should proceed to the domestic arrivals reclaim area. To These were some travellers' tales. New York, then to Rhode Island. How are you going to get there now? 
I have no idea. I just picked up my luggage downstairs in a mess. I don't know where it's going to go from there. Before you got on the DC-10, were you worried about it? Well, in, in Los Angeles, where I was, uh, every news report had a big write-up about the, about the incident of the DC-10s. So it makes you feel very much on edge. Why did you travel by DC-10? Because it's felt cheaper. Like well, Freddie Lake was cheaper. Simply because of the money? That's my reason. How do you feel about all this? I'm quite disgusted because I do believe they knew a little bit more about it a couple of days ago. Because we did hear about it and there was doubts about it then. This delay is due to DC-10 operating restrictions and passengers are requested to await further calls concerning this flight. All around the world then, the DC-10s were rolled back into the hangars to await the outcome of investigations. A spokesman for the FAA in the United States declared there was a distinct possibility that the model might never fly again, a move unprecedented in recent years. The story was the same everywhere. Once the alleged trouble area had been pinpointed, all models were called in and examined for possible defects. The initial order from the FAA was for a check on the flutter bolts, which helped to secure the pylon to the wing. There are two of these on each side, about 10 centimetres long, made of high tensile steel. They are carefully checked against the maintenance manuals, and every aircraft gets the same treatment. The checks are thorough, but could the safety of such a huge aircraft really depend on such a small component? Many people doubted it at the time, and generally the tests on the bolts proved inconclusive. Cynics said the bolt affair bore all the marks of a public relations exercise. Each bolt costs a mere $40, and is the size of a man's finger, making an easy story for the media along the lines of the old fable, for want of a nail, a kingdom was lost. The aircraft industry, it was felt, would prefer to condemn an easily replaced component rather than admit to any large and basic deficiency. These fears were only strengthened by the FAA's eventual order to ground the DC-10s because of serious metal fatigue. Skytrain operator Sir Freddie Laker, however, thought the ban was too hasty. He maintains incorrect maintenance is the root cause of the trouble. There's no doubt about it. And McDonnell Douglas, the manufacturers, have said this, the FAA have said this, that there have been some maintenance procedures used that are not in accordance with the recommendations. And there is no doubt that all the cracks that I know of that have been found, have all been found in aeroplanes that have had their engines and pylons assembled together. In other words, and what is more, I gather that most of them, not all, but most of them, have been assembled together by means of using a forklift truck. We all say that the fault in the DC-10 was created on the ground and was not created in the air at all. And I honestly believe that the FAA have panicked in Washington, meanwhile, the FAA has been continuing its investigations after defending its actions at the Congressional Subcommittee hearings. The FAA agreed it had received reports about pylon assembly problems in recent years, but said that no serious safety problem had emerged from them. At the hearings, FAA Administrator Langhorne Bond declared he had done the best he could, given the knowledge he had at the time. He would have grounded the plane at any point once there was clear evidence available of a definite threat to safety. It should keep these planes on the ground. Any hint? Uh, well, say going back to... The first airworthiness directive was, was primarily based on the finding of a bolt, okay, right a day after the crash. And with that piece of information in hand, we went out immediately with... Uh, in conjunction with the safety board's recommendation, we were together on that, with an inspection of that area. The sheer weight and thrust of the DC-10's powerful fan jets could be causing metal fatigue in the pylons, or it could be faulty maintenance that's to blame. More basic design faults, which leave the aircraft helpless after a partial failure or accident, could also be proved. 
And it's not only the Americans who are waiting to find out. Operators and passengers around the world are wondering whether the sight of a climbing DC-10 will be as common in the future or whether it will ever be seen again.